Hello, dear ones. Hello, family. You're at home. You're at home with Jim and Joy. You're an important part of the EWTN family. You're never alone. You can email us at jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Jimandjoy at EWTN.com. And Joy, my mind and heart today, maybe it's our special guest that we're going to be speaking with, uh, Ramona Trevino, uh, former manager of a Planned Parenthood, now incredible witness to the gospel of life, proud to call herself pro-life and pro-family, but my mind is filled with divine mercy, mm -hmm. thoughts, and God's grace to her and to us all. And those passages, those Bible passages, the stories that Jesus told about uh, the woman sweeping the floor looking for her lost coin, and when mm -hmm. she finds it, she, she tells all of her neighbors, I found that coin that was lost, and now I found it. And the shepherd that goes out and looks for the one sheep, that one lamb that has gone astray until he finds it and carries it and brings it back to the rest. And then finally the, the father who calls back the son that when he sees that son beginning to return, he runs out to the mm -hmm. son mm -hmm. and, and, and goes to him. God's grace, God's mercy to us all, how we need to remember that, especially in this pro-life work. Especially what is wonderful is that in the month of November. We have so many things to be thankful for. And uh, it's important that we count our blessings and not our troubles. Mm -hmm. And we look for God's divine, affirming love and grace and mercy. You know, maybe you have a loved one or son or a daughter that you think it, they're a lost cause. They're so far off. Ain't no way they're ever coming back. Well, we were just talking about some of the quotes about Yogi Berra. It ain't over till it's over. And the, the beautiful thing is God never gives up pursuing us. He's always looking for us. He's always coming after us, even when we are far, far away from him. And it, we and the, our guest today, and Ramona, and sharing her story of mercy and grace and the beauty of being rescued back when we've all, we've all are lost and we've right. all have gone right. astray. We all have made um, poor life choices and we suffer the consequences of them. I, I wanna share a story of divine mercy and grace. The other day we we're closing out cases of our clients and uh, we had a woman who had come in nine months ago and she was pregnant, she was married and um, but her husband was pressuring her to abort the baby because of money. There was just, financial wasn't a good time and they were, they were foreign, they moved to the country and they were trying to make it in America and it wasn't gonna be a good time to have this baby. Well, we did the ultrasound and she decided she was gonna choose life and she was gonna go home and tell her husband that she wasn't gonna abort this baby because she already had an abortion in her life before marriage and uh, she wasn't gonna do that again. So one of our counselors called and closing out the case and uh, she said, uh, hey Joy, she came into the office and she said. Uh, this is the counselor telling you. Yeah, yeah, she came in, she said, I just closed out this case and uh, she named her baby Joy. It was her only girl. So this woman who was considering abortion strongly mm -hmm who you shared with, who chose life, named the baby after you. Yeah, and that was, that was wonderful. <laughs> that was divine, divine mercy, divine grace. And, and it was that we just told her the truth in love. And she really wasn't uh, hardcore. She was being pressured. She was feeling hopeless. She was scared. She was confused. Right. And uh, we were just there at the right moment, at the right time, to woo her back, yeah. to say, you don't want to do yeah, this and yeah. uh and there was great celebration to be had and so therefore the grace of god go i we all um can do terrible things we could panic in the heat of the moment we can all make poor life choices but you god be you and be clearly deceived yeah. um, but god is coming back and he's always yeah. full of extravagant yeah. mercy yeah. Yeah. he is full of extravagant grace yeah. and his love endures yeah. forever and so we as a people of god cannot be hopeless we need to be hopeful yeah. and there may be many women out there or guys who are post abortive and you're saying gee i wish i had made that decision i didn't god must not want anything to do with me you couldn't be more wrong he's come for those who are mm -hmm. sick mm -hmm. he's come for those who are hurting um, he's coming for you. He's coming to pursue you. Say yes to him. Say yes to his divine mercy. We're going to be speaking with Ramona Trevino, 
It's an amazing story that she has. She's a wonderful pro-life speaker and author of Redeemed by Grace. It's item 9144, Redeemed by Grace, item 9144, EWTNRC.com, or 800-854-6316. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy. And today we bring you another fine, beautiful woman of God. Her name is Ramona Trevino, and she's a pro-life speaker. She's an author, and she's written a fabulous book called Redeemed by Grace. And you can get that book at Religious Catalog. It's item number 9144. And you can always go to the website EWTNRC.com or 1-800-854-6316. Six three one six. It's a great read. It's a great story. The most important thing about the story is that it's his story, right? Because Jesus is always writing straight on all of our crooked lines of our life. Mm -hmm. So we want to welcome Ramona Trevino to At Home with Jim and Joy. Come all the way from Texas with your baby, who's mm -hmm. eight months old, so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And one of our other producers is keeping her right now. <laughs> so, um, but Ramona, we just want you to tell our audience at home, our family at home, your beautiful story, what God has done in your life, and now you have his story to tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you, first of all, for having me on and giving me the opportunity to share. Um, just like you said, you know, it, it's God's story. And mm -hmm. I think that's what really prompted me to um, share it in the book, you know, to write a book right. about my story. I just wanted to glorify God through um, my experience of mm -hmm. what I had experienced regarding my conversion out of Planned Parenthood. Um, so basically, you know, I, I was a cradle Catholic, as many uh, of us are fortunate to be, mm -hmm. um, but I grew up with, with no formation. Right. So my mom and dad were married in a Catholic church. Thanks be, be to God, they're still, you know, together. Mm -hmm. And um, But it was a rocky road. You know, it wasn't a leave it to beaver type of, you know, experience or anything like that. Um, somewhere along the way, you know, we get lost. And um, I remember, I tell the story in the book, you know, that I was eight years old and mm -hmm. I remember um, my mom and dad were, we're arguing mm -hmm. and you know, usually when we're kids and we hear our parents, you know, argue, it's frightening, mm -hmm. especially if, if the word divorce is brought up. Right. Um, and so that's, that's what I heard. And I remember climbing up a ladder uh, that was outside of, of our home and getting up on uh, top of the rooftop mm -hmm. and talking to God. And that's the earliest memory wow. that I have of, of really God affirming, you know, mm -hmm. that he heard me and that he was real. And I held on to that for many, many years in secret. It was something I'd never shared with anyone um, because what happened was I'd ask God, you know, are you, are you listening? Are you real? Show me a sign. And the whole sky lit up with lightning. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it may have been, you know, a storm yeah. in the distance or what have you. But for me at that very moment to ask God, are you real? Are you listening? And then have the whole sky light up. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, it, it carried me throughout my whole life. And mm -hmm. I held on to that. Um, I did become pregnant at 16. I was in a difficult relationship with the father of my daughter. Um, I go into more detail in the book. It's, it's, it was a difficult story to tell, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but I felt like it was really important. Uh, and then somewhere along the way, I ended up at Planned Parenthood, which is usually the, the question that I always get because mm -hmm. when people find out, well, you were Catholic, how yeah. in the world did you end up at Planned Parenthood? Right, right. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting to, to look back now in hindsight and see how that all that all played out. But you know, even Abby Johnson in her story, Unplanned, where she tells where she was a Christian and she went in thinking that she was helping women. Mm -hmm. um, just that deception, how that is. Mm -hmm. And so, so, but you're a mother, you have four children, mm -hmm. right? And you're married nine years, mm -hmm. living in Texas. And so at what, when did you go into Planned Parenthood? What, when did that happen in, in what your journey? Of, yeah. yeah. Um, 
my husband and I were married in 2006, and then I began working for Planned Parenthood in 2008. Okay. And we had actually just both entered fully into the church in 2005. So mm -hmm. he was missing the sacrament of confirmation, and I was missing uh, first communion and confirmation. Mm -hmm. Give me those dates again. Um, 2005, we entered into right. fully into the church, and then 2006, we were married, and mm -hmm. then 2008 is when I began working for Planned Parenthood. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And um, it was just, you know, I look back and think, you know, the, the enemy is very crafty mm -hmm. in, in the way that he deceives us yes. and lures us in. Right. You know, for me, I was looking for a part-time job. Mm -hmm. um, this opportunity was going to be part-time. Mm -hmm. I had just come off of working uh, as being a stay-at-home mom for mm -hmm. the first time. Mm -hmm. I had just taken the first in my ever in my life taking a year off to be at home with our first son uh, prior to that I'd worked 40 hours a week so mm -hmm. I, I only knew you know being a full-time mm -hmm. employee outside of the home and so I was looking for part-time work and I was looking for something to where I could balance that with being a mom at home as well uh, and wanting to contribute to our income mm -hmm. and I was also looking for something that was a leadership role mm -hmm. for me and so all of these little elements came at the right moment, right? And, yeah. and I thought, wow, this is a great mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. I was gonna have the opportunity to be a manager, work three days a week, um, be able to have a, a decent income, not anything extraordinary or, or anything, but you know, yeah. something I could be, feel good about. Uh, felt like I was contributing. Mm -hmm. And then I also felt like I was helping women. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's where the deception came in. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, was, how was this opportunity to work at a Planned Parenthood presented to you? How did you find out about it? How did you hear about it? What was the package that was being presented that you would think it, it's so positive? Right, right. Well, and initially it was, I heard about the, the position through a friend who I used to work with at, at a previous em employment. Uh, and she called me up and she just kind of sold me mm -hmm. on the idea of working for Planned Parenthood. And she said, you know, Ramona, with your personality and, you know, I know how you like to help people, she, this is right up your alley. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought, okay, this is, this is great. You mm -hmm. know, three days a week and it's kind of what I'm looking for, something kind of close to home. Uh, and so I applied and interviewed and just all, honestly, in the back of my mind, I kept, all I could kept thinking about was manager. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a great oh. opportunity. Mm -hmm. I can put this on my resume and move on later down the road, right? Mm -hmm. I'll stay a little while and then mm -hmm. move on my way. Um, but I think that's kind of where, um, and the way it was presented was that, you know, there's this opportunity to help women and be part of this greater cause, right? Mm -hmm. right. Uh, and and for me, I, I didn't find it necessary to look into Planned Parenthood or, or investigate who this organization was, um, especially the history mm -hmm. of Planned Parenthood and, mm -hmm. at its roots. Uh, and so I, I think I was just blinded really in, by, by the idea of having everything there that I wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. But your, the center that you worked at, it, w they weren't performing abortions, Correct. right? So when you went there, why don't you explain to our family at home what exactly that facility did? What right. did you do because you were helping women? Right. You know, we think about um, especially what's going on right now with Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. in the news and so many people that support this organization for the good things that they provide. You know, looking back, I, you know, it's easy to see that it's not comprehensive health care, mm -hmm. but um, rather in my mind, I thought, okay, well, this is affordable gynecological care, mm -hmm. um, and that's really and everybody, how, every woman needs that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, your your Pap smear, mm -hmm. your um, pelvic exam, mm -hmm. manual breast exam, mm -hmm. no mammograms, right. <laughs> uh, STD screening, mm -hmm. um, you know, birth control, yeah. um, and that was it. So, uh, you know, for me, I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm helping underinsured or poor women, or you know, women who who don't have these these services el can't find these services elsewhere. Uh, but uh, the reality is that there were other places there yeah. in Sherman that offered these services and actually at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So explain to us now, you've, you've entered the doors of Planned Parenthood. What, what was the name of your facility? Um, it was uh, Planned Parenthood of North Texas. North Texas. It, that was the affiliate at the time. I think the affiliate's changed okay. now. So y y you've been called to be the manager mm -hmm. of that. How many staff? What's it like? Your mm -hmm. beginning days? Um, you've never managed uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, a center, like right. a Planned Parenthood. What, what's going on at the beginning of this? How is it evolving? Right. Um, when I first began, um, Sherman was a small clinic. So we were a staff of three, myself, a family planning assistant, and our nurse practitioner. Um, we only worked Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And when I first started, I think we only saw about three or four patients a day, you know, when I took over from the previous manager. Uh, and really, I mean, not to toot my own horn or pat myself on the back, but I, I was a really good manager. Mm -hmm. I ended up, we ended up moving from three people a day to a, about 20, 22 on average. Yeah, it's a huge day. increase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was, what was the makeup of your client? What, what the area that you were in, it was, about 30 minutes, I thought you said, from your yeah, home? Yeah, it was about 30 right? minutes from my home. And so wh who was your target audience? Who were, who were you uh, attracting? Were you attracting high school students? Were you attracting college kids? What was near there mm -hmm. where you were to develop a clientele? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I didn't realize then what I know now about the demographics and where they place their clinics. Um, but it was certainly within the the area of two colleges. Mm -hmm. So there was the Austin College and then there was the Grayson Community College. Mm -hmm. um, both of those located within very short radius of the clinic. Um, and then also they always are located in a, in a more um, lower impoverished community. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize that because I wasn't too familiar with the with Sherman, mm -hmm. but now that I look back, I think, wow, mm -hmm. you know, it's very strategic as far as where yeah. they place their clinics. Right. So when these girls are coming through, um, how are they, what information are you getting from them? What tests are they going through? And then I would imagine quite a few of them are coming in concerned they might be pregnant, really vulnerable mm -hmm. in their lives. And then maybe they get a positive pregnancy test. And w so how do you evaluate? How do you screen them? And then where does it go once they do get a positive right. pregnancy test? You're a referring center. You're not doing abortions right there. Right. Doesn't mean that you're not culpable, although you may have thought you weren't culpable. But so w what's happening with these women going through their tests? Right. Um, so when they come in for a pregnancy test, uh, there's a form that's long, it's many questions mm -hmm. for just a pregnancy mm -hmm. test, you know, I, and um, and towards the bottom, the, you know, it says if this pregnancy test is positive today, what, okay. what type of information would you like? So you're letting them tell you mm -hmm. um, versus you tell them what they're going to do. But um, abortion is the first option, adoption, and then prenatal care. And we were just trained on, you know, if it's abortion, you know, go through the steps and the referral information and where to send them. And, um, you know, it was called counseling, mm -hmm. yeah. but mm -hmm. I, I didn't, you know, see any much counseling going on. Um, you know, I think the, the very first abortion referral that I did, you know, that, that was very difficult for me. Um, mm -hmm. That's when all the, the justifications began, mm -hmm. you know, and, and me trying to justify what I was doing mm -hmm. because I, I didn't go into Planned Parenthood r with the reality of I was going to refer for abortions. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I knew it was a possibility, mm -hmm. but I guess, you know, I just hoped that I wouldn't ever have to face that like reality. Like you, you said, your focus, and this is the deception thing, and well, you, you're saying, how can I be all that I can be? How can I use my abilities, and how can I grow, and how can I be used? And, so that's what you're thinking about, mm -hmm. and you're missing all the other um, important factors that are there. But this was a, a point of provocation and provoking you when you had to make your first referral. So were you the one counseling, or, or the counselors do the counseling, then they come to you and say, we have to refer her to a, a Planned Parenthood where they do do abortions. Mm -hmm. How did this come on your lap? Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a counselor. Mm -hmm. You know, right. it's it's either the nurse practitioner, myself as a manager, okay. or the family planning assistant, which is basically a medical assistant. Um, so there's really no no counseling title mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. uh, that exists within Planned Parenthood, especially in regards to the referral facilities. Um, but for me, the, I just remember the day like it was yesterday. I my assistant was having lunch, and I said, you know what? keep eating, I'm gonna go and I'll take this young mm -hmm. lady back yeah. and, and do the pregnancy test and go through all the steps with mm -hmm. her. Um, but I had failed to see that she marked abortion mm -hmm. as her option. And um, I just, I congratulated her on her pregnancy and then she burst into tears. Mm -hmm. And I re immediately began to backpedal and thought, oh no, you know, what did I do here? Yeah. Um, and then I thought, okay, how do I refer her without being 
a, an accomplice mm -hmm. to abortion because immediately my f own faith began mm -hmm. to play, you know. Yeah. There was conflict. Yes, mm -hmm. it was a conflict mm -hmm. and I thought, okay, how, how am I gonna do this yeah. now? Yeah. Um, and I, I, I began to rationalize in my head and think, okay, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let her make the choice. Mm -hmm. It is her decision. I'm not here to judge. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna do my job mm -hmm. and say, this is your option uh, and give her the information. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And when she left the, the clinic, uh, she was in tears. Mm -hmm. And then I went into my office and burst into tears. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I really can't explain what happened at that moment, what, why I was so overwhelmed with emotion. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Ramona Trevino. Uh, who once managed uh, a Planned Parenthood, and she's sharing her incredible journey and story, uh, moving out of deception, and God bringing more and more light to her. And so we want to continue to unfold this story, but we're going to take a break at this point. When we come back, we'll continue this discussion, the most important discussion. Please don't go away. You're at home with Jim and Joy. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and we were just sharing with Ramona about the first time that she made a referral for an abortion and um, how that convicted her, that it, it was starting to like, oh, wow, what, what was that about? And you were troubled in your office about that. Um, so continue on with that story just about how you stayed still even after you were still struggling with that and, and your conversion about that. Right. Um, you know, I think I think what happened, you know, the moment that I was in my office and I was crying, I think when I look back and I think, what, what was it that caused those tears? Mm -hmm. um, was that I was having to decide and make a decision. Do I conform with what I'm doing here mm -hmm. um, and begin to move forward justifying my work? Or do I make a stand and say, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. This is against, you know, everything that I believe in. Um, and I think that's when that first spiritual tug of war began to take place. Mm -hmm. And once I gave in to that, um, it became easier over time. Mm -hmm. Once you gave just... into rationalizing. Yes. Right. So yes. when you first had that, con that, that tweaking conflict. of conscience, yeah. uh -huh. Uh -huh. it was still a couple years, a few years mm -hmm. before you finally came yeah. out. So you rationalized and, and what took place? Did you get harder right. in that? What, what, what softened you as you went on? You know, I think it was a back and forth. Okay. You know, I, I noticed that my heart would become hardened, mm -hmm. but then it would become softened. Mm -hmm. And I think honestly, mm -hmm. um, because I was going to mass on occasion mm -hmm. and receiving the Eucharist unknowing, unworthily, mm -hmm. but unknowing that I was yeah. not worthy. Um, and I just think that, you know, it was all by the grace of God mm -hmm. that I was still being, he was still reeling me in and mm -hmm. I was still moving, you know, taking two steps forward mm -hmm. and three steps back. Um, but, you know, it, it, I noticed that through that process because when that first abortion uh, referral took place, it was just within the first few months that mm -hmm. I was working there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I ended up managing for three years. So it was a constant tug of war, spiritual back and forth, saying to myself, okay, um, you know, more rationalizations, right. more justifications, and really believing that I lived in this gray area in which there, there was, okay, I don't work in an abortion facility, um, therefore my hands are, are not, right. you mm -hmm. know. I'm not that I contaminated. Have, yes, yes, I don't have blood on my hands there, mm -hmm. um, but yet, trying to figure out, okay, what am I truly facilitating mm -hmm. in abortion? And then it got to a point where I just locked it away. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it anymore. Yeah. And just went through the motions of my job. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the staff that you had with you, um, so you had a nurse practitioner, mm -hmm. and um, were they with you or did you, were, were, did they come out too, or they, they stayed with you all along the journey? They were there uh, the, the mm -hmm. three years. Mm -hmm. I did have a different uh, family planning assistant mm -hmm. though that mm -hmm. uh, one quit and then a new one came in. But um, 
you know, I think they, you know, if you if you kind of look at the the type of employees that are there, I think mm -hmm. a lot of them have similar experiences. A mm -hmm. um, lot of them identify as Christians, mm -hmm. um, different denominations, yeah. of course. But, uh, you know, I think even Abby Johnson has said this before, you know, these aren't bad people. Right. You know, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's, it's a beautiful thing to keep that in mind, mm -hmm. you know, that we all have that goodness within us and, right. we, and we need that constant prayer. What? You said you kept on tucking it away, or mm -hmm. you know, sticking the ball Shoving away. Shoving it back in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, what or who, what transpired to begin to take this out in a way that mm -hmm. made you look at it longer and begin to have to deal with that? What were the steps, or what happened? Right. Was it sudden? What? Right. It was an ongoing process, definitely. Um, there was always little things that would occur that made me question, mm -hmm. you know, who is this organization? Mm -hmm. And little things that would kind of frustrate me. Uh, one example for, you know, just to give you an example, there was a Plan B competition, I talk about this in the book, mm -hmm. uh, in which we had a back stock of, of emergency contraception, mm -hmm. and then they had a, a competition to see who would, which clinic would sell the right. most Plan B, mm -hmm. and whoever sold the most Plan B, their, each employee would get a, a you know, a Visa card, mm -hmm. gift card. Mm -hmm. uh, and initially I was all for it. And I thought, yeah. yeah, this is great. I could use the extra money. Mm -hmm. um, but just, you know, just after a few days of doing that, I thought, you know, this is, this is wrong. Right. You know, this is unethical. Uh, Share I'm not a drug moment, plan pusher. B mm -hmm. and how that can function. Right. Um, you know, from my understanding, yeah. it, it does function as, it can function as an abortifacient drug. Mm -hmm. It is very powerful. Um, uh, I think sometimes we've yeah. described it as, you know, five times the strength of mega birth doses control. of yes, birth mega control. Yes, mega doses of birth mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. right. And so if a woman takes it within the first, I think it's yeah. the first 72, 72 hours, hours of, mm -hmm. of, you know, yeah. unprotected yes. intercourse. And then, I just wanted yeah. our audience to understand that Plan B does work as an abortifacient. Mm -hmm. That's one of the actions it could take yep. and you can lose that child through partaking of that drug, but go ahead. So there was this competition and you began to see, hey, this is, what are we yeah, doing? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I just didn't see myself as, I, I almost felt like a drug pusher, mm -hmm. you know, uh, on, the, on the street corner, sure. right? You know, peddling this plan B. Mm -hmm. uh, it just didn't make sense to me because it wasn't medically indicated for the, for mm -hmm. the patients. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was gonna expire, so we would give these women two mm -hmm. packs at a oh. time, mm -hmm. and we would tell them, well, you can put the other one on your shelf, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm thinking, well, in a few months it's gonna expire, then what good mm -hmm. is it gonna do? Right. Wow. Um, so, you know, these type of things, you know, got at me and and then the the fact that we were kind of overworked and we felt like we were always constantly being uh, pushed to pack the schedule and mm -hmm. get people in and out and that was frustrating because I thought that we were an organization that was supposed to care about women's health and who were supposed to take time we're using you yeah right. mm -hmm. absolutely nobody likes that yeah mm -hmm. and, and it really it, what it boils down to is it's about profit and mm -hmm. it's about revenue uh, numbers and right. goals and patient uh, you know quotas to meet mm -hmm. um, you know and anyone who tells you different is lying right yeah well it's business and that's how business rocks and rolls absolutely. you know it isn't it isn't about a ministry and a, a vocation and a service that you're providing right. I mean you are really you're running a business and it's all about the bottom line right. But, but the big deception is, is that you are producing a culture of, um, of saying you can have as much sex as you want and you can, ha you can have sex, start having sex when you're in high school because if you go to any Planned Parenthood website, I mean, they have sex education for middle school. And so to say, you're, you need to start having sex. You need to be with that boy. That boy needs to be with you. And um, and there's contraception, and you're going to be protected, and you won't have an unplanned pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Right. But the biggest deception is you create a client, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, perfect example. Um, you know, you said high school, but really middle school. Right. Even. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a young lady I remember who was 12 years old, right. whose mother brought you know her mother brought her in mm -hmm. because her pediatrician right. would not put her on contraception, mm -hmm. and so they said, okay, well, Planned Parenthood would do it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, there was that conflict too, as a mother, mm -hmm. you know, of a daughter who was around that age while I was working for Planned Parenthood. You know, I, I preached chastity and abstinence at home, but yet I'd go to Planned Parenthood and it was the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. And it, it was challenging me. And I, again, you know, made rationalizations for that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What brought the pieces together? How did it begin to come together? Or there's a lot of fissures in your in your life going on here and conflicts. What what 
brings it together to the point that you've got to come to that place of right, decision. Right, where you just finally have to examine what's going yeah. on here. Um, Catholic radio. Catholic radio. <laughs> yeah, okay. Catholic radio. I love being able to share that with mm -hmm. people. Uh, that Catholic wasn't planned either. No, I was gonna say no. That, and we Catholic love radio was the um, where the seed was planted, mm -hmm. and I, I stumbled upon upon Catholic radio um, during close to Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, I was out doing some shopping, and mm -hmm. I was flipping through the dial. I was conflicted about a lot yeah. of things, um, some changes that were going on in the organization. And um, I can't say exactly what I was searching for, but the Holy Spirit definitely knew. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as I'm flipping the dial, I land on Catholic radio and they're talking about Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. at that very moment. Wow. They're talking about Planned Parenthood. Um, it was a two part segment. One, they had women who were, um, who were Catholic, who mm -hmm. had called in, who had had abortions in their past. And then another segment was about contraception mm -hmm. and for the very first time I'd ever heard the word abortifacient mm. and um, when I heard the word the term abortifacient and began to understand what abortifacient was mm -hmm. and since I was contracepting that was when I began to become more challenged mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because it may it forced me to take a deeper look inside of myself and say mm. okay well Ramona on this hand doesn't believe in abortion because mm -hmm. I didn't personally think, I wasn't personally okay with abortion. Mm -hmm. um, but Ramoni on the other hand is taking abortive, potentially abortifacient drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I had to, it forced me to take a look at that. And so that's kind of where the conversion starts to take place mm -hmm. from that moment. Mm -hmm. Of course it began, uh, it was a process. There was about a five month process after that before mm -hmm. I finally left Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. But it needed to, I think it needed to progress in that way in order for me to really look at all the different pieces of the puzzle mm -hmm. and to be able to come back and say, I, I need to get out of here. Yeah. But you know, isn't that the beauty of the Holy Spirit? Like, you know, they're out driving in your car, shopping for Christmas, and, and you turn on this Catholic radio, and they're talking about a company that you work for. Mm. But then what the Holy Spirit does is like, oh, God, well, what are they saying that about my company? And, you know, you can get all riled up about that, but then the Holy Spirit even goes a step further and talking about con contraception. For you just to say, well, I'm compromised, but I'm Catholic. And that's the journey of truth. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Holy Spirit does to us. He doesn't hit us over the head and where, well, sometimes he does and knocks <laughs> us off horses like right. happened to Paul. Um, and but, but most of the times it is that slow journey where he just reveals and nudging and then all of a sudden it's like, Lord, I'm compromised. And I, not only that in my own personal life, being Catholic and doing this, but, but I'm, I'm pushing something that maybe I don't totally believe in. Right, right. right. Yep. And I think really, really what, uh, what even took it deeper for me was that our organization was wanting managers to start giving Depo Provera. Mm. And when the priest who was the guest on this segment uh, was speaking about abortifacient drugs, he brought up Depo, Depo. Provera. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, Ramona, wait a second. If I begin give to, you know, injecting women mm -hmm. with Depo Provera, right. and it potentially could lead to an abortion, right. then I will actually have a, a direct you mm -hmm. know, relation with abortion. And mm -hmm. that was really challenging for me. Mm -hmm. And that's when I just started thinking, okay, well, I'm gonna have to re-examine this. Um, and again, you know, I, I tried to tuck it away and not, yeah. didn't want it to yeah. resurface again because um, it was something I was gonna have to take a closer look at. Mm -hmm. And it was scary. Yeah. It was very scary. I wasn't ready to do that How yet. did you do it? How did you, you say re-examine, it may yep. have really been your first examination, really. <laughs> but so <laughs> right. what, what, what did you do? What were the steps? What took place? And how did you reach a conclusion? Uh, continued to listen to Catholic radio on um, every day that I went to work. I would listen to it on my way in and on my way out. And uh, over and over, hearing, you know, the, the pro-life uh, segments mm -hmm. and listening to all these truths that the yeah. Catholic Church teaches mm -hmm. um, and learning something new every yeah. time about my faith. So it was actually deeper than just the, the pro-life cause, mm -hmm. right? It was just uh, another level of the fullness of, 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 it the fullness all. of your mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. And so I was half living my yeah. faith. Right. I don't know that I would even say half, maybe mm -hmm. quarter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but you know, with, uh, with every segment, just listening to these different shows and hearing these, these beautiful truths about um, Catholicism that mm -hmm. I never knew before. So all of that began to kind of lead me further along. 
which really brings you to the beginning of your story that you are somehow, some way, finding a false affirmation or a limited affirmation in taking the job in the first place. Mm -hmm. My gifts, my abilities, my management. Now you're hearing the true gospel, mm -hmm. truly wanting to affirm the essence of your being as a human right. being, as a human person, and that's connecting also with what you're doing and what you're doing isn't right. about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's you know that's so many of us can relate to that mm -hmm. yeah. in mm -hmm. our lives and uh, for me it just it seems like I look back at my life and see this constant you know back and forth right. and, and kind of going around in circles right. you know kind of finding my way to God and then going back the other mm -hmm. direction mm -hmm. um, and, and it wasn't until you know I got into Planned Parenthood and had my conversion that I was actually fully back around and feel like now more than ever in my life, I'm, I know where I'm supposed to be mm -hmm. and my eyes are fixated on the Lord yeah. uh, in a way that they never were before. And I know that I can't go back now. Yeah. Well, and that's the beauty of Catholic radio and Catholic television, you know, because um, maybe we're not hearing it from our churches or maybe we were, people out there hadn't been catechized properly mm -hmm. and you really didn't understand your faith or knew what you, you know, what, what the church was teaching you. But the beauty of Catholic radio and Catholic television, so many people have been catechized in their faith. It's like, I'm learning about it. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. That's what the church teaches. And that, that, and all of us, every single day, no matter how long we've been walk, walking with the Lord, we're, we, we're all compromised. Mm -hmm. But Jesus is always calling us, say, mm -hmm. come deeper, mm -hmm. come deeper into the faith, come deeper into these waters. And, and sometimes it means giving up livelihood. Mm -hmm. And just because he, say, he says to each and every one of us, do you love me more than this? Mm -hmm. Ramona, do you love mm -hmm. me more than this? Mm -hmm. And but it's like, but Lord, it's, it's providing income, it's doing this. But, but he's saying, come, come with me right. and be with me. And that's, that's the beauty of all of us on the journey of truth and holiness. Mm -hmm. Well, we have one more segment with Ramona and we don't want you to go away. So we're gonna take a little break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of the family, and we want you to join us live at home. You could be sitting in our audience right here with us. We would love that. So we want you to contact the Pilgrims Department, and you could take a pilgrimage all the way to Hansville, Alabama, to Irondale, Alabama. You could see the Blessed Shrine. You need to go to pilgrimages at EWTN.com or call 205-271-2966. We would love to have you here. Yeah. And it is a great spiritual journey. You could see the great and amazing things that God has done at EWTN just because a beautiful Mother Angelica said yes. So come on down and see us. And it's just amazing on our end, we do shows like these and nobody's really around besides the crew. And it's kind of like, did we speak to anybody? Did that just really happen? It'd be great just to touch somebody and uh, just be together and shake hands and take a few pictures together. So we want to meet you. Come on down. Okay, well, right now we're going to go straight to Rome because Joan has some wonderful words of wisdom to share with us. Joan? Well, hello to all of you at home. Greetings from Rome. And you know, I have to say, Pope Francis this week at the general audience did something for which we at home are all very grateful. He spoke once again about the family, in particular about the family as the place where we learn pardon and forgiveness and reconciliation. And speaking of the family, he spoke of the just concluded synod and he said the synod fathers have given him their thoughts, their conclusions on all the work they've done the past two years. And he himself is going to write a document, he the Pope is going to write a document, but he said, I'm not going to reflect on it today, I still have some thinking to do about those conclusions. But he said in the meantime, life goes on, life does not stop. For families, it certainly doesn't stop. You're always journeying. And he said on that journey, sometimes we, maybe even frequently, we offend people, we hurt people. 
and he said that when we do this, we must remember the words we say in the Our Father. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he asked everybody to say that with him. Now the Pope said, there's a very simple way to heal wounds, to ask for forgiveness. And he said, never end the day without apologizing. And the Pope said this, if we learn to say we're sorry immediately and to offer mutual forgiveness, the wounds are healed, the marriage is strengthened, and the family becomes an increasingly solid home. And Francis said, to say we're sorry, to ask for pardon, sometimes is just a simple gesture. Touch someone on the shoulder, hold their hand, Sometimes that is all you need. And he said, if we learn to live this way in the family and then outside the family, outside the home, it is society as a whole that is the beneficiary. Well, that's our time, so back to you at home. Thank you so much, Joan. Wonderful report and uh, so much there on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And Lord, forgive us our trespasses and to say that to others. What brought you to that point in the work that you were doing as a manager of a Planned Parenthood and all the different conflicts you began to feel, but there was that moment, that time where you knew you needed to ask for forgiveness. Well, what brought it together? Right. Um, you know, I think when the, when the um, conversions first began, I knew that I needed to get into reconciliation right away mm -hmm. uh, and confess where I was working and what had been, you know, using contraception and all of that. So that was really the first step. Um, and so I think that's why it was so important for me to tell my story in this book was to really share with the reader the importance of the sacraments mm -hmm. and the beautiful graces that come from especially the sacrament of reconciliation because oftentimes we, we're kind of afraid to go <laughs> to confession. Yeah. Um, but there was this aha moment for me uh, that, uh, that really needed to take place. And that was when, again, on a drive home, I flipped on the radio and listened to Barbara McWiggin who was speaking to a gentleman who'd called in, who had been involved in the pro-life cause for many, many years. And um, she said some really profound words to this gentleman. And for me at that moment, it was no longer Barbara speaking. Yeah. It was as if God was speaking mm -hmm. to me through her. Um, and she says something along the line of, you know, um, when at the end of, of our time, right? We're gonna stand before our maker and he's gonna ask, what did you do? First, he's gonna ask, did you know about abortion? Mm -hmm. And then he's gonna say, and what did you do? Um, and for me, that just, you know, was like a dagger to my heart. And I can see myself standing before God and, you know, God judging me saying, Ramona, did you know? Mm -hmm. And I was going to have to respond, yes, Lord, I did know. And he was going to say, and what did you do? Mm -hmm. um, that changed me forever yeah. because not only did it change my, the way that I, my perspective on abortion and how I came to, to realize that, yes, I was facilitating in, yeah. in abortion. Um, but it also changed the way that I saw every aspect of my life mm -hmm. because in every way we're going to stand before our maker. That's right. And he's going to say, did you know this? And did you know that? And what did you do? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it allowed me to be always conscious of, of the things that I do day in and day out. Um, although I'm not perfect, I fail every day, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and I need God's grace every day. But um, that really for me was the, the turning point where I realized this is urgent. I can't just kind of go, okay, well, I'll leave once I have another job in place or I'll leave after a few months. Uh, it became a reality of that this was no longer about my life here on earth, but my life after. Oh. Right. Uh, and um, it was shortly after that, that I experienced this beautiful divine experience on Divine Mercy Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I didn't know about Divine Mercy Sunday, didn't know the story of Divine <clears throat> Mercy Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always joke and tell people, you know, I only knew it was Divine Mercy Sunday because it said so on the bulletin. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, but I had this profound experience, which makes it even more profound yeah. because looking back and realizing now the story of Divine Mercy and thinking, oh my goodness, what took place mm -hmm. at yeah. that day? Mm -hmm. You know, sitting in the pews and hearing God's voice say, you know, trust in me yeah. and have faith in me, mm -hmm. leave it all behind, mm -hmm. you know, and um, you're forgiven. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I sat there with just tears streaming down my face because I knew what God was asking of me. And he was saying, 
you know, take this leap of faith. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not gonna be another job lined up. Right. There's not gonna be another paycheck that's right. gonna come. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm asking you to just leave it all on the seashore. And, and it, actually in my book, I, I go into the lyrics of Lord, when you came to the seashore, because that song was playing mm -hmm. during communion. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was as if God was speaking to me through those lyrics. And he was saying, leave it all mm -hmm. on the seashore, follow me. Yeah. And, uh, and I knew in my heart, that that's what I had to do. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful and so powerful. And I, I hope that all of us are really listening to what you're saying. And it seems that it's both really leading you to that decision, you know, that you have to, in a sense, leave everything and, and follow him. He who loves father, mother, sister, or brother more than me, or jobs more than me, come and follow me, come and follow me. But he's speaking that with divine love and mercy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just a, a legalism, although we don't, you can't compromise the truth and the commandments of God, but it's this compelling love calling you to the truth and to be all that you could possibly be, yeah. converging upon you at that moment. Yeah, yeah. and then, so you, you had that epiphany, that revelation, like, oh my God, what, what have I done? Look what I've been involved in. Mm -hmm. And now the repentance, the conversion, and then what? Mm -hmm. Did you go back to work and go, I'm done? Uh, did you go home and tell your husband? I mean, how, how, what was your next what, step? What happened right. to Divine Mercy right. Sunday? Yeah, what was well, the next Divine Mercy step? Divine Mercy Sunday, and then Monday morning I woke up, and I didn't work Mondays. Mm -hmm. I was work Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. Right. Um, and I kind of went about my day, and, and I remember calling my dear friend Lauren Muzika, uh, and uh, she's in the book, so right. people know who she is and when they read it. we had her on our radio yeah. show. She yeah. does Sidewalk Advocates, advocates for yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. and um, I remember calling her and telling her, I'm gonna leave, I think I said at the end of the month. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, that's that's wonderful, but if the Holy Spirit calls you sooner, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. Um, and then when I woke up Tuesday to get ready for, for to go into Planned Parenthood, it was as God was reaching back in and saying, hey, do you remember right. what happened on Sunday? Right. And, uh, and I knew, I knew right then mm -hmm. it, I had to go. I, could, I couldn't go another day. Mm -hmm. um, so I called my friend Lauren again and I said, you know what, I'm leaving this Friday. Um, and that really, the decision to leave on Friday was important because I needed to get everything in order and yeah. I needed to leave in a way in which wasn't suspicious to Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because we had seen what had happened to Abby and mm -hmm. we didn't want to repeat that. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we tried to do it in a way which didn't raise any kind of suspicion. It allowed me to gather everything, all of my personal belongings, um, leave the clinic in order and and then walk out okay. um, because I still had a sense of, of my integrity mm -hmm. as an employee. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't want to just up and leave, and I, I, I took into consideration my coworkers mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. um, and that's why I didn't just quit that day. Mm -hmm. But um, it, the beautiful thing is is that God would would design this so beautifully that. Uh, for those days, those final days, we ended up having no patients. Isn't that they wonderful? They canceled mm -hmm. the whole schedule. I didn't have a nurse mm -hmm. practitioner that the rest oh. of the week. Mm -hmm. And he also allowed me to uh, counsel a young lady who was abortion minded and she chose life. Oh, Hallelujah. The Lord. Yeah. So that was yeah. my final days uh -huh. at Planned Parenthood. You see, that's so beautiful. But God, you, this is how he works. He's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's like you met him, you said, yes, Lord. And then he took care of all of the fine details. But he, all he's asking is, do you love me more than this? Will mm -hmm. you walk away? And Ramona, in our faith journey and yours and our viewing audience out there, everybody at home, we all know there's gonna be another call up. You know, it's not like this is it and it's over, Jesus, I'm sold out. <laughs> because he's always saying, there's more, let it go, let go of this world, yeah. let go, because there is eternity to live with him. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, this is this is one conversion, but there's always more conversions, you Absolutely. know? I mean, he hasn't stopped with us. And it's just like, really, Lord? Mm -hmm. And he's like, yes, show me how much you love me, you know? When you finally made the break and, and left and the days following, did you have any sense of greater clarity or things lifting from you or new perspective or was it just another step in the process? Did you, what was it you like? You know, it was a combination of many things. Um, you know, there was of course this, this clarity yeah. uh, about what I was doing, what mm -hmm. I was, had done, yeah. um, but there was a great deal of, of um, I had to reconcile a lot of things mm -hmm. and also um, process what yeah. I'd been through. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then God really took us on a spiritual journey, mm -hmm. the whole family, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we were, again, trusting yeah. in mm -hmm. God, uh, especially financially, yeah. because of the burdens that would come mm -hmm. and follow mm -hmm. uh, financially. But again, you know, through it all, I look back, it's been four years now, mm -hmm. and I look at God a, a, and think, wow, you've never left us. And, um, you know, after that divine mercy experience, those words, Jesus, I trust in you, mm -hmm. have become the words that I live That's by right. every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when the anxiety tr starts to try to, you know, come in or, or you start to worry about little things in life, it's Jesus, I trust in you. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I trust in you. Mm -hmm. And I always go, it always yeah. brings me right back to those, that day that I took that leap of faith and yeah. saw that, you know, God carried me through mm -hmm. uh, no matter what. Right. Know? Yeah, I'm thinking of a, that scripture verse that says, he will lead the blind in right pathways. And I think sometimes the Jesus I trust in you is just simply saying, I, I can't see it all, I don't know it all, I, I trust right. in you and somehow, some way, he led you out mm -hmm. and he continues to, to lead you, mm -hmm. you know, ever closer to him. You have a closing thought or some words you'd like to share with people out there, maybe especially struggling uh, with their own sinfulness or maybe abortion and, and the work of divine mercy that can take place. Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, the experience of di divine mercy is, is just put a whole new perspective on what Christ offers us. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for, for those folks who are struggling with, with sin and their brokenness, I think it's all, it all comes back to this, this a tremendous amount of love mm -hmm. that Christ mm -hmm. offers mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've seen a whole new perspective when I look at the cross Right. Now. You know, there's the cross and then the res resurrection. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we focus on the resurrection, you know, then, then the cross becomes something that we can bear. Ramona, mm -hmm. thank you so much thank for you. sharing your witness and your testimony, your story. I pray that many of you have been encouraged today and that you will know that God could take every evil and turn it to a good, the curse into a blessing, death and turn it into life. Amen. Come to Christ, lay down your life and follow him once again. God bless you. God bless all of your loved ones. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.